Drexler's extraordinary revelation that a signal had been received from outer space threw the Roswell incident into a completely new light. The talk had always been of crashed UFOs, but this seemed every bit as incredible. A Cold War spy balloon detecting an extraterrestrial communication. The question Gregory now needed to answer was this. Was there any connection between the Roswell signal and the signal received by SETI astronomers almost 50 years later? of Eureka-themed products to be in the shops by Christmas. Perhaps, when you're weary of civil war, you're bound to find flying saucers more appealing than flying warplanes. In Russia, already beset by civil war, some saw the signal as a sign of deliverance, and false UFO sightings began to proliferate. This man told us, I thought at first it must have been my hangover, but I hadn't been drinking. There were these bright lights in the sky hovering right above me. Meanwhile, countries of the Middle East reacted with ambivalence. Islamic leaders rejoiced at finding the universe contained more of God's creatures. But governments hostile to America dismissed the reports of extraterrestrial communications as a trick, an excuse for the US military to place weapons of mass destruction wherever it pleased. In the face of mounting international protest, the UN went into emergency session. On the agenda was how the Earth should respond should the UN initiate an international space program? And was the US controlling the contact with the aliens? Two months later, they were still arguing. Three months after the discovery of the signal, the American public was frustrated at the lack of progress. An impatient Congress demanded the US take the lead in this new space race. The pressure for unilateral action came as no surprise to NASA's research policy advisor, Rosemary Gallo. I've always believed that this kind of discovery would generate a lot of enthusiasm, both on the part of the public and for the scientific community. What it gave us was a concrete focus for all kinds of space research. The scientific community felt strongly that the signal should not belong to anyone. And while they desperately needed better telescopes, most scientists wanted to avoid the politics of where the money came from, the US, the UN, or elsewhere. Finally, on the 13th of October, 2001, Congress decided the matter with a huge reallocation of funds for extraterrestrial research. The money came from three bodies, NASA, the military and the National Science Foundation and it amounted to about 20 billion dollars each year for 10 years. What it covered was space exploration, uh, manned and unmanned, a new telescope program, defense systems and genetic engineering. It was inevitable that genetic engineering would become a part of the new initiative. If human beings were ever going to travel across the galaxy, they would have to live beyond their natural lifespan. To achieve this, it would be necessary to create humans that had been biologically modified. At a secret conference in November 2001, a group representing a range of disciplines, science, the arts, religion, philosophy, and the military, debated the moral and pragmatic implications of making contact with aliens. We need to make plans for lots of different strategies, defusing situations, protecting ourselves, uh, as paranoid as it sounds. It's a, a presumably cultured species of some sort. We've never found one before. We have never had the need to communicate with one before. And the, the goal is to find these people and communicate with them and find out something about their mode of intelligence and their mode of living their lives. Like the media, they too began to speculate on the appearance of the aliens. But government officials knew their efforts to decode the extraterrestrial message would be wasted without new telescopes that could receive a much clearer signal. They asked us what we wanted, and we said 73 100-meter telescopes all grouped together which is an extraordinary collecting area, and we got it. It was like Christmas. 
prior to 1997 was only a few million dollars a year. It was just an extraordinary turnaround. By the spring of 2002, the new telescope building program, which continues to this day, had begun. The European Union now also began construction of a telescope, as did Japan's massive Sekai Corporation. But these projects paled beside the US effort. And yet, across America, opposition was growing. Pay enough tax as it is already just to keep the economy going. Uh, uh, I, I just want to see some results. You're listening to The Jack Bingley Show. Now, who's our next call? Radio stations reported a flood of calls, some supportive, but many angry about the high taxes needed to build telescopes. See, what I wonder is how ordinary people are supposed to know... Just how stupid do they think we are? There hasn't been one shred of hard evidence to prove that these aliens actually exist, you know? Yet, we're supposed to... And the government, government knows it. If you want to know what the government is really up to, just look at history. Everybody knows the American economy and the world economy is in one hell of a mess. It helps them get more money for research, more of our tax dollar. But doesn't actually do any of us ordinary folk any good at all. As confusion grew throughout 2002, more and more people wanted to know what the existence of extraterrestrials really meant to them. In his Easter address, the Pope could only report that a Vatican committee was still looking into the matter. But in America, evangelists like Dr. Reg Grant were trying to meet the need for guidance. Science is not our God. But neither is it our enemy. Science has provided us with this data, and if this data, if this data, suggests order and symmetry and design and and purpose in the signal, then it's up to us as thinking men and women to study it, to test it, to pray for wisdom. Eastern religions, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, which respect non-human life forms, were now finding more converts even in remote corners of America. But it was the Mormon church which proved most attractive of all. In America, membership had doubled to nine million since the discovery of the signal. As Dwayne Jeffrey and Kimball Hansen explain, the reason lay in the very nature of Mormon doctrine. The Mormon church, since the time of its organization in 1830, has always harbored a belief that there would be planets elsewhere in the universe that are inhabited by intelligent life. That idea is celebrated both in Mormon songs, music, and in scripture. Indeed, an early Mormon scripture presents a conversation of God with the prophet Moses. And worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for mine own purpose. For behold, there are many worlds that have passed away by the word of my power, and there are many that now stand, and innumerable are they unto man. But all things are numbered unto me, for they are mine, and I know them. By September 2002, America had spent billions of dollars on new telescopes that were finally able to receive the signal in its full detail. They enabled scientists to confirm that the signal was actually a picture, made up of a grid of dots. But they still couldn't make out what the picture was. It was frustrating. We had all the equipment that we wanted. We were getting the signal perfectly. And uh, what we read was a bunch of dots. It was, um, it was like if you were running home to watch the football game and someone cut the cable and all you were reading was snow. But there was something else about the signal that now worried the astronomers, something they would have preferred to keep to themselves. The frequency of the signal was varying, but not in the manner we would normally associate with a planet spinning on its axis. Unless, of course, you were viewing the planet pull on, which is highly unlikely. 
It's also not the sort of frequency change we would normally associate with a planet spinning around its sun. The obvious implication of this was that the transmitter was moving, but was not on a planet. From the beginning, the Pentagon feared the signal might originate from a spaceship heading towards Earth. Now this new information sent shockwaves through the military. Their anxiety grew when four weeks later their early warning systems detected an unexplained object in orbit, 14,000 miles out in space. They eventually concluded that this was no more than a piece of space debris, but not before US forces had been put on full alert. A few days later, information about the military's false alarm was obtained by the press and something close to panic ensued. It was during this period of intense anxiety that Cheryl Davis heard again from her elusive informant. I'd been collecting documents over the previous months under the Freedom of Information Act, trying to get more evidence on the alleged infrared signal that they'd gotten at Roswell. When he calls up, and it's that same familiar voice, and all he did was leave an address for a motel in Albuquerque, and he asked that Bill or I meet him there. The caller's identity is still a mystery. Gregory went to the motel, where he met one of the most influential men in America's military history. There, once and for all, he heard the full story of what happened at Roswell and why the government had been so secretive. When Cheryl called, I'd pretty much given up on the Roswell tip-off, so I really didn't know what to expect when I pulled into that motel. I sure as hell didn't expect Major Alexander. As Davis and Gregory knew, retired Air Force Major Howard Alexander had been involved with the formation of... I must confess that I felt somewhat ridiculous setting... I was under strict orders not to disclose this information to anyone. Alexander confirmed to Gregory the extraordinary truth about Roswell. A Project Mogul balloon had picked up an extraterrestrial signal. But Alexander also finally revealed why the government had kept their discovery a secret for all these years. In the late 40s and 50s, he explained, there was already tremendous public concern about alien beings and UFOs. We are your friend. We are your friend. This made the government deeply nervous about how people might react to news of a real extraterrestrial communication. Alexander had been a member of a secret committee in the early 50s and showed Gregory its classified report outlining the government's plans to use films, television and radio to educate people about... But according to Alexander, the committee realized their plan had backfired. As talk about extraterrestrials increased, people were becoming even less rational in their beliefs. Well, as I say, it started first with a very decided tingling all over my body. I seemed to become one with the entire universe. By the end of the 50s, we were forced to conclude that our educational efforts had not produced the results that we were after. We felt that they had done nothing more than feed the public appetite for science fiction. So we were forced to conclude that if confirmed information about extraterrestrials was made public, that it would cause mass hysteria. We genuinely believe that. But in Alexander's view, the 2001 communication changed everything. He felt Roswell held the key and urged Davis and Gregory to go public. In their resulting newspaper article, they described the signal received at Roswell and the subsequent cover-up. But perhaps their most startling revelation was the claim that the ET signal had influenced the space race. The launch of Sputnik, they wrote, spread panic around the Pentagon. If the Soviets were ahead in space technology, then how was anyone to know they weren't also ahead in communication with extraterrestrials? There was really only one option for the US. Even if they found the Soviets had made ET contact, they couldn't leave it to them. The space research program had to be accelerated. 